Welcome to this second part of this edition of Abled and On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently abled. I've always been your host, Lauren Seiler. Arlene is off today. On this second part of this edition of Able Then On Air, which is the Disability Awareness Day, we focus on bringing down the House and the Senate, how to talk to your legislator if your special needs. This includes a talk with the Green Mountain Self Advocates and how to practice, how do people with special needs practice their agenda to talk and advocate with their legislators. Let's take a look at this. Because when you tell someone what's going on in your life, it really has an impact. Because you know what it's like. You know, you can study something forever, but once you hear from someone the impact, like the ADA had on people's life, it really makes it understandable. Well, my boss has been there a while. He was one of the supporters of the first American Disabilities Act in 1990 and was proud. In 2008, he led legislation to expand and clarify the protections offered under the ADA. There were concerns that some of the courts were interpreting the law differently, from being a little more restrictive as to how they interpret the law, and it also expanded the ADA to cover epilepsy, multiple sclerosis, things like that, other disabilities that impacted people. And he's made a commitment over the years to support traditional nominees who get lifetime appointments who will support the ADA. And he's voted against those traditional nominees who have not committed themselves to support. And it's really important to remember that lifetime appointments to the court can have such an impact. You know, nothing in a democracy is permanent. That's why we have elections every two, four, six years. And when you have a lifetime appointment to a court, that's not something that you can change. And he's also been supportive of nominees who will understand the right of Congress to write legislation that enables laws that the courts have to follow. But it's not going strong, but we've seen that with the Supreme Court last year and some of the appointments now. In fact, he submitted written questions to Attorney General nominee Sessions about his support for the ADA, and the Attorney General was less than uh, middle in how he would do as far as protecting those, those rights. Now last week, about, I think on the 15th, the House actually passed some legislation that lowered the burden for public places like restaurants to accommodate to kind of put the burden more on someone with a disability to make the point that they had not provided those accessibility standards. There hasn't been a similar bill introduced in the Senate. With any luck, there probably won't be, but I can assure you that if it were to happen, that Senator Lady and many others would fight against that. So all I'll say to you is that your voices really do matter. They matter here in Montpelier. They matter down in D.C. And my boss has been so proud to be able in the origin of the American Disabilities Act, and it is a bipartisan issue. And this day, where we hear a lot about polarization, there are some things that people do come together on, and that's one of them because we all know individuals who have different challenges than we do. We all face life in different ways. But you have a delegation between Senator Sanders, Senator Lane, and Carson Walsh who will continue to fight for the rights that you deserve. So thank you for what you're doing here. It does make a difference. Thanks. delegation will do all they can to defeat it. 
It reduces disability programs by $72 billion. That includes both SSDI and SSI. It cuts SSI, a program that benefits low-income people with severe disabilities. For example, 1.2 million children received SSI uh, at, for, for conditions such as Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, autism, intellectual disability, and blindness. The budget cuts nearly $7 billion over 10 years for benefits for children and parents if another family member also receives SSI. Hurting, for example, families with children who share a genetic disorder. Some 70% of poor families that care for more than one child with disabilities already struggle to afford basic needs like food, rent, and heat. Under the guise of, quote, simplification, the budget also cuts more than half a billion dollars over the next decade from SSI recipients who live with others outside of their immediate family to make ends meet. The budget cuts SNAP, eliminates LIHEAP, our Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, and raises rents on families receiving low income rental assistance. It makes $1.4 trillion in cuts to the Medicaid program. And in addition, it cuts $5 million from our already underfunded independent living programs. As Bernie says, Trump's budget pays for his huge tax cuts for the rich and large corporations by slashing Medicaid, cutting Medicare, and slicing $10 billion from the Social Security Disability Program. Bernie will do all that he can to stop these cuts from happening, and he thanks you for your strong support and advocacy. He will continue to advocate on behalf of those living with disabilities at every stage of life. Have a wonderful Disability Awareness Day, and thank you. So Kevin Elmer, the representative of Peter Wilkins' office, was unable to attend today, as she's helping her son look at colleges over the winter break. She said, I'm so sorry on so many levels not to be present for Disability Awareness Day. Given my background in the disability field and the congressman's own focus on health, human services, and social determinants of health, please give Peter's best to the group. He's in strong support of the disability community and recently has taken up a number of positions that are important to Vermont advocates. Most recently, he's voted no to the ADA notification bill. Congressman Welch sends best wishes to an outstanding group of people doing important work while inspiring the community at Disability Awareness Day. Thank you, Kevin Bell. So, <laughs> so now I'd like to introduce Sam List, a leader in Vermont's disability rights community on many levels. Sam serves on many councils and boards and wants to share an update on an important issue he helped advocate for. Thank you. Um, a bit of good news that I want to share uh, with the disability community. Um, in keeping with the theme of this year's Disability Awareness Day, I'm pleased to announce that on January 1st, 2018, enhancements to the Medicaid for Working Persons with Disabilities, or MWPD program, took effect in the state of Vermont. Advocates worked on these changes for many years. <laughs> Not an exaggeration. And with multi-partisan support, three of the four changes came to fruition. These changes will allow more people with disabilities to work and to work more while retaining vital health care coverage. As we all know, employment is a major social determinant of health. People who are employed have been shown to be healthier than those unemployed and thus less costly to the healthcare system. In addition, these people are more productive socioeconomically. Therefore, such changes to social programs are a win-win effort. Many people with disabilities who, for example, require attendant care services 
provided by Medicaid and not necessarily by private insurance to be able to work, will be able to do so and accrue assets. They will be on the road to self-sufficiency, self-confidence, and independence. The changes within Act 51 of 2015, approved in 2017 by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and yes, by this administration, are, one, the entry level asset threshold has been increased to $10,000 for a single and $15,000 for a couple, more in line with thresholds in many other states. Two, there is now a spousal is income disregard. The income of the spouse not applying for or eligible for MWPD will be disregarded in determining one's MWPD eligibility. And three, when an MWPD beneficiary reaches full Social Security retirement age, which is soon to be 67 in two years, his, her retirement Social Security cash benefit will continue to be disregarded after conversion from SSDI, providing, of course, all other eligibility criteria are met. This removes an unfair work disincentive upon reaching retirement age. Many people, including those with disabilities, are able to, want to, and need to work beyond retirement. This change precludes an unfair spend-down simply to retain their vital Medicaid. I would like to thank all of the legislators and administration staff who made these changes possible. We will still need to rework a fourth potential work incentive enhancement that was at least temporarily disallowed by CMS for technical reasons, the so-called reverse spousal disregard. Other states have implemented such a disregard, and with a change in language in the Medicaid state plan amendment, it is possible to implement in the future. It would disregard the income of the MWPD spouse for the purpose of determining eligibility of the non-MWPD spouse for certain types of Medicaid. So stay tuned. This is, as you might suspect, this is all part of our community, our health and our well-being. Thank you. So next up, we have our facing state treasurer and the Able Act champion, Beth Pierce, here to give us an update. Welcome, Beth. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today and talk a little bit about Able. ABLE is uh, achieving a better life experience. It's a uh, program that was passed in Congress. Not a lot's been happening over the last several years in Congress, despite the fact that we have the best congressional delegation in the country, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and uh, it was passed, and it allowed states to put together this program, and uh, we were able to do this in 2015, um, and uh, it's a great program. What it is intended to do is help ease the hardship of individuals with disabilities by allowing you to save for the future and to have uh, financial independence. So basically, what you can do is assets held in an ABLE account are exempt from consideration for state and federal benefit programs, so the benefit clubs that we're all dealing with, and I really appreciate all the work that folks have been doing to address that. And allows you to put money into a, a, a tax deferred savings account, up to $15,000 a year, so people that are working, we want to put some money into that for the future relatives or folks that would like to contribute. Uh, it, it's a great program. Uh, at this point in time, uh, we've, uh, we, we've worked very hard to make sure that uh, folks around the state and, uh, are, uh, understand that uh, eligibility for SSI, Medicaid, and other public benefits are not affected by putting the money into this, into this program and work very close to the folks. Right now we have... Um, this was as of November 30th. Uh, the average account balance uh, was such that it was $3,800 per person, which means we've already had people exceed the benefit cliff uh, level by about $1,800. Uh, we had, as of uh, 218, 128 enrollees, so 128 people are in the program. Um, it's a really terrific program, and uh, it's, a, it's an ability to have some financial independence and to save for the future. 
Uh, I want to compliment uh, 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 my policy director over there who worked on the legislature. Put your hand up there so people can see. Can read it. Well, give him a hand, please. <laughs> updates on the amount of uh, folks that are enrolled in the program and it's three or four it's growing every 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 week. Uh, we want to see it grow even more because the more people in it frankly the fees go down. And uh, so from our end you know we want to make sure that we can do that and we want to serve as many individuals uh, with disability as possible. So we brought some materials on it today. I'm not sure where we're going to be able to put them right over there. If you're interested in the program check it out. You can call our office, check out our website um, and, or would be happy to come to any meeting, any place in the state, to have a conversation about this. It is so important. Yeah. Bottom line for me, it's also linked to a financial literacy program. You can use it for, uh, for, uh, for your daily needs and expenses as well as save for the future. It's, it's a wonderful program. Not much gets out of Congress these days. Uh, this is a good one. And uh, so thank you very much and uh, continue to work. This was a partnership with the dis disability groups and rights groups. And I want to say thank you very much to the folks that worked on this program. Thank you very much. And we're going to continue to advocate so that individuals with disabilities have the same ability to access financial programs and to, and to have financial independence in their lives. Thank you very much. I invite you to stick around for the 10 a.m. workshop on the human costs of cuts with Susan Aronoff of the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council. Susan will be looking at the impact of budget decreases on the social determinants of health. Also, I want to remind everybody that at 3 o'clock in this room, the Vermont Leadership Series Class of 2018 will be presenting their projects and will be graduating. So we hope that you will join us in celebrating their success at 3 o'clock today. We are so excited to welcome a new group of self-advocates and family leaders to the field. Make sure that you grab an agenda for the day at the outer table or over here um, to know when and where everything is happening. It's a really full day for everybody and we're hoping that you get a chance to take full advantage of it. If you have any questions, members of ECDR will be around to help throughout the day. Please make sure you sign in at the registration table outside room 10 at some point during this day. It's important to know who is here. If you want to get emails about advocacy issues from the coalition's um, alert list, please give your current email when you sign in. Um, I also heard from our lieutenant governor that he would like to put forward in any remaining cards back. So if you can put that up on the table when we're done with it in the room, I will make sure that happens. Before we end this part, I want to recognize Stephanie Monty, our amazing event coordinator from the Vermont Center for Independent Living, and the committee who put this great day together for all of us. We have some applause for them. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, and have a great day talking about our community, our health, and our well-being. Happy Disability Awareness Day. Thank you.
important to remember that lifetime appointment to the court can have such an impact. You know, nothing in a democracy is permanent. That's why we have elections every two, four, six years. And when you have a lifetime appointment to a court, that's not something that you can change. And he's also been supportive of nominees who will understand the right of Congress to write legislation that enables laws that the courts have to follow. But it's not going strong. We've seen that with the Supreme Court last year and some of the appointments now. In fact, he submitted written questions to Attorney General nominee Sessions about his support for the ADA, and the Attorney General was less than uh, middle in how he would do as far as protecting those, those rights. Now, last week, about, I think on the 15th, the House actually passed some legislation that lowered the burden for public places like restaurants to accommodate. It kind of put the burden more on someone with disability to make a point that they had not provided those accessibility standards. There hasn't been a similar bill introduced in the Senate. With any luck, there probably won't be, but I can assure you that if it were to happen, that Senator Lady and many others would fight against that. So all I'll say to you is that your voices really do matter. They matter here in Montpelier. They matter down in D.C. And my boss has been so proud to be able to support the origins of the American Disabilities Act. And it is a bipartisan issue. In this day, we are here all about polarization. There are some things that people do come together on, and that's one of them because we all know individuals who have different challenges than we do. We all face life in different ways. But you have a delegation between Senator Sanders, Senator Lane, and Carson Walsh who will continue to play for the rights that you deserve. So thank you for what you're doing here. It does make a difference. Thanks. Stop these cuts from happening 
and he thanks you for your strong support and advocacy. He will continue to advocate on behalf of those living with disabilities at every stage of life. Have a wonderful Disability Awareness Day, and thank you.
still need to rework a fourth potential work incentive enhancement that was at least temporarily disallowed by CMS for technical reasons, the so-called reverse spousal disregard. Other states have implemented such a disregard, and with a change in language in the Medicaid state plan amendment, it is possible to implement in the future. It would disregard the income of the MWPD spouse for the purpose of determining eligibility of the non-MWPD spouse for certain types of Medicaid. So stay tuned. This is, as you might suspect, this is all part of our community, our health, and our well-being. Thank you.
also, I want to remind everybody that at 3 o'clock in this room, the Vermont Leadership Series Class of 2018 will be presenting their projects and will be graduating. So we hope that you will join us in celebrating their success at 3 o'clock tonight. We are so excited to welcome a new group of self-advocates and family leaders to the field. Make sure that you grab an agenda for today at the outer table or over here um, to know when and where everything is happening. We have a really full day for everybody and we're hoping that you get a chance to take full advantage of it. If you have any questions, members of ECDR will be around to help throughout the day. Please make sure you sign in at the registration table outside room 10 at some point during this day. It's important to know who is here. If you want to get emails about advocacy issues from the coalition's um, alert list, please give your current email when you sign in. Um, I also heard from our Lieutenant Governor that he would like his clipboard and any remaining cards back, so if you can put that up on the table when we're done with it in the room, I will make sure that happens. Before we end this part, I want to recognize Stephanie Monty, our amazing event coordinator from the Vermont Center for Independent Living, and the committee who put this great day together for all of us. We have some applause for them.
given another example. I don't know your name. Marjorie. Marjorie's example, I'm sorry, I didn't give your example first. The first example was that someone who's receiving community support wouldn't be able to get to activities outside of her house without that community support. And those activities include things like therapeutic um, horseback riding. And the other example from Marjorie was that without um, her social security income, she wouldn't be able to pay her rent. Are there um, other examples?
but let's say I get confused with directions and with the bus, so if I do that, that way I won't get confused with the BC, and I am able to still get around where I need to go. Okay, so um, Nicole was talking about being able to get some transportation uh, assistance um, from Howard, which one of the other things I want to mention in the time that we have together is Howard is a type of agency. It's called a designated agency. How many of you have heard of designated agencies, DAs, and specialized services agencies, SSAs? So of hands, folks who've heard of DAs and SSAs? So the designated agencies and the specialized services agencies receive a lot of public money, Medicaid money, um, public money, to provide services on behalf um, of the state, they receive money from the state, to provide services to people with um, a wide range of disabilities to meet a wide oh. range of needs. And one of the things that the Developmental Disabilities Council, who I work for, has worked on really hard last year in the budget and this year in the budget is trying to make sure that the people who work for the designated agencies, the people who work for Howard, who work for United Counseling, who work for Washington County Mental Health, that these people who do the work, that keep people independent and in the community um, and happy and healthy and working, um, it's really important that these people have a living wage, a livable wage. And so last year in the budget process, the legislature put money in the budget so that, that the direct care workers at the designated agencies and the specialized service agencies could have a wage of $14. And that was supposed to be phase one. Everyone called it phase one. Because this year was supposed to be phase two, where there was supposed to be money in the budget so that that minimum wage could go up to 15, but also so that other workers in the designated agencies and the specialized services agencies um, could get more of a living wage, more equal to what other state employees get paid doing similar to work, or what people get paid doing similar work in hospitals or other organizations. Because right now, there's a staff turnover rate of about, I said I was going to talk a lot of numbers, so uh, apologies, of about 25%. That means one in four, one in four workers at a designated agency or specialized services agency has to get replaced each year. And aside from that being very disruptive to the people that they serve, it's also really expensive to the organization. It costs a lot of money. But the reason why they have this high turnover rate is that they cannot pay enough to keep good people on staff long term to do this really important work. So one of the things that um, we've been talking about with the budget committees and that I hope you guys talk about with your senators and your representatives is the need to implement phase two of the wage increases for the designated agencies and the specialized services agencies. We have a lot of fact sheets about technical issues of things like wage compression and those turnover rates, all kinds of information. If you want information to give to your senator or rep, we've got it. If you just want to tell them, I need these services, my friends need these services, these services depend on a well-paid, qualified workforce, stabilize that workforce, that's enough to tell them. So that's a real big issue, and I want to make sure, since a couple of you have mentioned workers from um, designated agencies being the ones who provide you the support, who provide you the services. A lot of you probably got here today with supports and services from the staff, from the designated agencies and the specialized support agencies. So that was sound like big words, specialized services agencies. You, you can just call them DAs and SSAs and everyone in this building will know exactly what you're talking about. Um, Along those same lines, if you take some time today to talk to one of your senators or reps, and I really encourage you to do that, and I, I'll be around, I can help make introductions, other people will be around, you can help make introductions. If you talk to them, 
Please talk to them about um, cuts to a lot of the human services programs. There's a cut to a personal um, attendant services program that will affect 42 people who rely on personal attendant care. And we can get you the facts on that. Um, there are cuts to people who receive developmental services on waivers. Those waivers are going to be cut across the board by about $4 million, 2% cut. That affects the real people, real respite hours, you know, the real services that people depend on, employment, really impacts quality of life. So um, please, it's great you travel here. If you came all the way here from Derby Line, like Mike did, and you folks from Brattleboro and Putney, um, take advantage of the fact that you're in the building out a senator or rep, um, ask us how, and say, please fund those salary increases, please stabilize those services, please don't cut services, please protect our Medicaid. Um, because you, we all, we could spend another hour in here with people sharing stories about what it means to them to have transportation, to have housing, to have food, and how it would impact all of us, um, if they didn't, and how it would impact health and costs. And someone over here said smartly um, how it, it was so scary. That if you pay for these services, <coughs> you end up having to pay less for emergency services and less for more expensive health care down the road. So please while you're here, my time is up. Um, my time is up, but while you're here, Please um, reach out, talk to a rep, talk to a senator, and um, express your views and your opinions. Make your voice heard. Thanks a lot for coming. Well, that puts an end to this edition, the second part of Disability Awareness Day at the State House. We cover Central Vermont. I'm Lauren Seiler. See you next time for part three of Disability Awareness Day in which we discuss the mental health policy update. Join Ed Pen Let's join Ed Penquin of Disability Rights Vermont on the next episode of Able Then On Air. Stay tuned. I'm Lauren Seiler. See you next time.